Susan is uh, is one of our own, and she leads uh, she she run, she leads a ministry called She Rises Ministry. Yep, if you can give her a hand of applause. And in Susan's ministry, she empowers women to become what God has called them to be. And so I'm excited to just present to you Susan Van den Heuvel, who has a word from God for us. Susan, God bless you for being available to share God's word with us. Well, good morning, Lighthouse. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited about the message that God has laid on my heart. Uh, How many of you, if I were to say that God has called us to be able to and equipped us through his Holy Spirit to be able to tell time in the Spirit. Just me? Okay. As I uh, have prayed about today's message, I believe that God's hand is upon it, and I do believe that it is and will serve as a now word for the body of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Tech team, I know that you don't have this slide. Um, it's, it's all good. I hope that I'm going to make your job a little easy for you today. We thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but the word of God, which is at work in you as believers. You know, I have been honored. The Lord has given me um, the honor of being able to declare his word. Uh, This is my 25th year of active ministry, and I don't say that to puff myself up in your eyes uh, and try to convince you that I'm all that in a bag of chips because I know I'm not. But I do believe that there is an urgency on this message this morning. And... The Lord, as he often does, woke me up in the midnight hour and reminded me of an appointment that I had recently. Uh, and as I, as I was being reminded of it, I thought, um, this just seems so odd. God, why are you reminding me of this appointment in the middle of the night when I'm very tired and I just want to be in bed sleeping? It was an appointment, like I said, I had a couple of weeks ago, and uh, in my personal life, I have a lot of moving pieces. I've recently stepped into a caregiver role for my parents, and so it's kind of been a little bit of a lot. And on this particular day, I was tired, and I knew that I needed to be at this appointment. It wasn't anything that I could reschedule. Uh, I needed to be there, and I kind of flew in. I was there a little bit little bit early and I checked in and just sort of kind of slumped down in the chair. I just sort of wanted to check out a little bit because I was tired. But eventually the person came out and called my name and I had to rise to my feet because my name was being called and it was my turn. So when I asked the Lord God, what are you, what are you saying about that? I believe with every fiber of my being that the Lord is saying to us as the church, it's time for us to rise to our feet. That he is mobilizing and he's calling us in this hour. Anybody? 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 reads, Be sober, well-balanced, self-disciplined, be alert, cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, and immovable. The title of my message this morning is Immovable Faith. And while I typically don't preach out of the message translation, I do want to read just this verse in portion out of the message translation. It says this, keep a firm grip on the faith. God gets the last word. Wow. I don't know about you, church, but I've read the end of the book and we win. We win. We win because Jesus has already won. Come on, somebody. And he's rose up from the grave victorious. And you and I 
can choose today that we will be people immovable in our faith because he first is immovable. Amen. Amen. The book of Revelation tells us that we overcome by what? The blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for you and for me. He did a complete work leaving nothing undone. There is no expiration date to his completed work on the cross. There is no updated version needed. Amen. Amen. However, we live in a world that would want to convince us, you and me, that our biblical values and the things that we believe in, the things that we've built our faith upon, they're outdated. That's a lie. It's a lie. The world would want us to believe that those things, they're maybe for your grandma and maybe for your great-grandma, but we're now new people. And we're in a new age. We're in a new era. And you need to, you need to catch up. It's a lie. It is finished. Jesus' last words on the cross. Wow. Our testimony is of all that he has done for us on that cross. And rising up out of the grave three days later. And what he continues to do in our work, in our lives every single day. He still is at work. We don't serve an idol God. Peter, the author of 1 Peter that we just read from, was writing to a group of people that were quite possibly battle-weary in their faith. Suffering for their faith is a major theme throughout this book of the Bible. And depending on your translation, it is mentioned 16 times in just one book of the Bible. Clearly, God is trying to tell us something. Peter covers it from the length and the purpose for suffering to undeserved suffering, suffering for doing what's right to our attitude in suffering, Rejoicing in suffering and God's promise to us after we have suffered. As Peter was writing to those suffering in their faith, he's reminding them of the goodness of God, despite all that they're walking through. That this world is not their home. I'm here to remind you of a few things today. This world is not our home. This isn't it. We're just passing through. Come on, somebody. Our citizenship is in heaven with glory with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That their sufferings do not go unnoticed by God. And to keep their minds fixed heavenward. We could end right there. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you next week. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have already overcome the world. I want to focus just for a couple minutes on this passage of scripture, this verse. I want us to look at this verse this morning and see what it is not saying. Jesus did not say, I am overcoming the world will overcome the world one day. I'm working on it. I'm giving it my best shot. No, no, no. He said, I have. It's past tense. Come on, somebody. It's past tense. He's already overcome it. Well, let's be honest this morning. Faith isn't denying reality. Having immovable faith doesn't mean like we pretend that whatever it is that we might be going through isn't challenging. That's not what we're talking about. Immovable faith is acknowledging what is the current reality, only immovable faith doesn't end there. It doesn't just stay there. It doesn't put a period there. Like, that's it. There's no hope. Immovable, immovable faith says, here's my reality, but here's what God's word says. Here's what I'm going through. Here are my questions. Here are my doubts. Here are my insecurities. Here are the things that is keeping me up at night. Here's what the doctor said. Here's what my boss said. They might be doing this. They might be doing that. I don't know what the government's going to do, but my God. But God. But God. 
On his word, I will stand firm. But God, two small words, just six letters. Wow, but they're packed with power. Immovable faith is believing that he is in complete control. And if he can keep this world on its axis, he can put the stars in the sky and tell them to stay, and they stay. That he created the depth of the ocean, and he says, you can only come this far. He created the heights of the mountains. You know what that tells me in my immovable faith, and I hope that it communicates and reminds you today? He's got you. And he's got me. And he's got this world. Our God is El Elyon, the Most High God. Come on, somebody. Our God is still fully alive, seated on high. He will never be outvoted, outdone, or outpowered, or outmaneuvered. That is who our God is. That is who we serve. That is who we serve. He is not walking. He is not pacing the floors of heaven, wringing his hands, trying to figure out what to do. Wow, I didn't see this coming. Now what do I do? I don't have an answer for this. Is that what the Bible tells us today, church? Wow, but God, immovable faith that even though I can't see him at work, maybe it's been a little while since I've heard his still small voice, I know that he's for me and he is at work in my life. Well, that was just the introduction, so I <laughs> hope that you brought your sack lunch. Just kidding. <laughs> Be at rest. <laughs> I want to read a story from the Bible this morning about three people with incredible faith. Um, word to our wonderful tech team, I love you, but you don't have this scripture passage either. This is something that God gave me here. Um, for the sake of time, I won't read the entire story, but I do want to lay a foundation upon which we will build for the remainder of our time together this morning. The story is in the Old Testament of the Bible found in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. In this chapter, we find a king named Nebuchadnezzar. He had a gold image set up, and all the people were to bow down and worship it. That's in verse 6. It was reported to him that three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, decided we're not going to bow down, we're not going to worship this image. And this made the king very mad. It infuriated him. And as kings often did, when they, um, when they heard that they weren't obeying the law of the land, sent out this decree I heard that you're not following, you're not doing what I told you to do, so I'm going to bring you into my presence, I'm going to bring you into my court, and you're going to have to give an account to your decision. I want to know why you're not doing what I told you to do. And in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, it reads this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve, oh, he's able to save us. He will rescue us from your power. But even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods we will never worship your gods. We will never bow down to what you have set up and you're calling us to worship. Verse 17, the God whom we serve is able to save us. And then they follow it up with verse 18, but even if he doesn't. But even if he doesn't, I don't know about you, but I want to even if he doesn't kind of faith. Anybody with me this morning? Even if he doesn't, I will stand. It's not a politically correct type of faith. It's not a blab and grab type of faith. It is a it is written kind of faith. Jesus modeled this so perfectly well 
in Matthew's gospel chapter 4 when he was being tempted by the devil. Do this and then you'll have this. If you say this, then I'll give you this. Listen, the enemy has nothing to offer you and I. But lies and deception. Baiting, his, baiting the people of God. But every time, who knows what Jesus' response was. Every single time. It is written. And I don't know about you, but I have decided I'm going to have an it is written type of faith. It is written type of faith. You're coming at me with this. It is written. I don't know how this is going to go. I don't have all the answers. I may have a few questions. I don't know. I'm, this seems a little like, I don't know how this is going to go, but my God, that's who I serve. And I'm going to choose to stand immovable in my faith because we are called to be people of faith, not people of fear. I'll go ahead and say that again. We're called to be people of faith, not people of fear. Let me hear it this morning. Come on. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We are called to fight the good fight of faith. That's who we are. We're called to fight the good fight of faith. And if we sit and we really unpack that scripture verse, you know what it's telling us? That there needs to be some engagement on our end. If you're going to be in a battle... We're not going to be able to stand very long if we just stand there with our arms down at our sides. Just kind of passive, que sera, sera, kumbaya, whatever happens, there needs to be an engagement. In this passage of scripture, Daniel chapter 3, we see there's one king and there's three men. The king demands that they bow down. The three men, what they do? They took a stand. And they stood their ground. Is there anyone here today that with me will say, I'm deciding that I will stand up in a bow down world? Five of us. I'll go ahead and say it again. Anybody with me that you're deciding today, I'm going to draw that hard line in the sand. And I'm going to say, I will stand up and be immovable in my faith in a bow down world. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, that we are going to be people who stand upon God's faithfulness. We stand for righteousness. We stand for biblical truth. We will stand on the promises of our God. Anyone here today with me that will say, I will not only stand when I'm here in the church, I'm going to stand out there. I'm going to stand out there. You might see me standing in my church service, but you know what? If you came to my workplace, you're going to see me standing there. Come on, somebody. You're going to see me standing immovable in my faith at my school, in the cafeteria, in the lunch line, at the, at the playground, at the grocery store. Wherever you see me, you're going to see me taking a stand immovable in my faith. Anyone here today with me that will say, you do whatever you want to, but as for me and my house, we're going to go with God. You do whatever you want to do, you can decide, you can do whatever, you can plan whatever, but as for me and my house, yeah, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. Wow. Thank you, God. Church, the God has not left us as powerless people. That's some good news. We are not powerless people. As the warrior bride of Christ, and that's who you are. That's who you are. You're the warrior bride of Christ. We are on the side of victory. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We're on the side of victory. We have been given everything we need to live from a place of victory, not for victory. Those are two different things. We're already on the side of victory. Already. Why? Because Jesus already gave it to us. Because remember, he did a complete work on the cross. Everything is finished. And that means your identity in Christ has already been given to you. And part of that identity is you are victorious. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6 lists the armor of God. <laughs> and then it adds, after having done all, stand. After having done all, stand. Here's the thing about that word stand. I, um, I'm, I'm a lover of words, and 
Uh, if you talk to my husband, he'll tell you, sometimes when I come home, she always wants to give me the reader's digest of things, and I just need the cliff notes. I'm a lover of words. I love words. But as I was thinking about the word stand, I was thinking that if we just kind of just gloss over that and we don't really pay any attention to the word stand, in our human nature, our human definition, we can look at that and we can think, stand, it's kind of idle. How many times have you heard, well, they're just standing there. Don't just stand there. Why are you just standing there? See, that's just a limited human definition. But if we zoom out and we look at this passage of Scripture through lens of faith, we see that standing is actually taking an active role and engagement of our faith. Wow. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you and I can be people who stand up in a bow-down world and take our stand and stand our ground. Billy Graham, Billy Graham has been quoted as saying, when one man takes a stand, it stiffens the spine of others to also take a stand. Wow, so powerful. Here's the thing about that. Here's the thing. When you and I make a decision to stand, it will create an impact in our sphere of influence. As Billy Graham said, it stiffens then the spine. It gives people courage to also take a stand. And so our decision isn't just about me. My decision to stand in my faith isn't just about me. Because every single one of us, myself included, God has given us a sphere of influence. I don't care if you're retired and you're rocking in your rocking chair. I don't care if you're a stay-at-home mom or you're in the marketplace. Every single one of us has a sphere of influence. And your decision can have an impact in that sphere of influence. Amen. Think about that. Who will be encouraged as you take a stand in your faith? Who's on the other side of that obedient yes? Wow. Our obedient yes, God, I'm going to stand in you. I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how this is going to go. My knees might be knocking, my palms might be sweaty, but I'm going to stand in you. I'm going to stand in you, God. Who, observing your life, your faith, will then also be encouraged to take a stand? Wow. See, it's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's about the people that God has placed in your life. Think about the people that you work with. Think about that. They may never approach you. They may be work in a different department. But make no, make no mistake. They recognize something in you that they may not have. Something that they're looking for. Hope. Peace. Joy. Because they've been trying to find it uh, in the things of this world. But if we, how many of you know, if we're looking for those things, all those things are subject to change. It's found in Jesus. It's found in him. If we try to attach ourselves to anything on this side of heaven, all of that is subject to change. That's why we need to look to God. When we read this account of the fiery furnace in Daniel 3, we see three men who had come into agreement. Mm. Together, we're in this together. I kind of like to put myself in their shoes sometimes. I don't know about you. I've been reading the Bible for a long time now. And, you know, they're men and women like you and I. And I think, I think that it's almost like they kind of had this mutual agreement, this conversation. We see how this could possibly go but we're in this together. We're in this together. There was an agreement. There was a oneness in the spirit and a singleness of mind. It's not just you over there standing. It's all of us. That could preach a whole sermon, just that. Not just you, Shadrach. Not just you. You go, wow, yep, you go. 
We, you know, we'll be praying for you. No, no, no. They came together and they came into agreement. We're in this together. I felt prompted uh, this morning to remind you that isolation is the devil's playground. Isolation is the devil's playground. God created every single one of us to be in community. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, he tells us, the writer of Hebrews tells us, do not forsake the assembling together. Why are we told that? Here's the thing, when, 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 when God was, um, you know, when he was writing the word, it wasn't like he was just bored one day and he was trying to fill up a bunch of white sheets and a, and a white sheets of paper in a book. Everything that's in there is purposeful and intentional. And so why did he know that you and I would need to hear that? Because the devil would want to pull us away. The pastor didn't say hi to you today and I'm just going to be offended. They're making some changes. Here's the thing. I've been preaching the word for a long time and I'm okay to stay somewhere. Making some changes. Never done it that way before. We always do it this way. It, it works if we do this way. Do it this way. What are we doing? They're rocking the boat. Who brought these people? <laughs> so I'm just going to allow myself to be offended. I'm just going to go for it. Do I have your permission to just sit on that for a minute? Jesus said, offenses will come. He said that. Why will they come? Because we live in a fallen world with imperfect people. I'm imperfect. You're imperfect. Nobody is perfect. We live in a fallen world. And so Jesus said, offenses are going to come. But here's the thing I would like to humbly submit to you. I believe that Jesus is saying it's what you do with it. It's what you do with it. So we don't have our heads in the sand, like, oh, I'm just going to glide through life and I'll never be offended. No, no, no. He said they will come, but what you do with it is what matters. So offense can come, but it's not in me. Those are two different things. Two different things. Isolation is the devil's playground. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20. Again, I say to you, if two or three are on the earth, um, let me back up. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. There I am. You know, if we go back and we continue reading the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, we read that the king did follow through with his threat and did have them thrown into the fiery furnace. And I'm paraphrasing here, so um, I encourage you to spend some time with the Lord and, uh, this week and read that passage of scripture, that story, uh, and allow um, his Holy Spirit to speak to you. But, you know, they, um, so they're in this fiery furnace, and the king, again, I'm paraphrasing, you know, he's kind of scratching his head, and he says to his servant, will you, hey, will you remind me, didn't we throw three men in the fire? How come I see four? Are my eyes failing me? Do you see four? Yep, there's four. We know who the fourth man in the fire was, don't we? And so... Every time I read that passage of scripture, I am reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 18. Where two or three are gathered, there I am. And it reinforces the truth that these three men had come into agreement. They were in agreement. There was a oneness in the spirit and a like-mindedness. Like they came together.
um, Mark and your team if you want to come forward. I really do believe that the Lord is here. Does anybody else just feel the palpable presence of the Lord this morning? Thank you, God. He is here. He's here. Whenever he enters a room, he brings all of who he is with him. That means there's salvation in the room. That means there's peace, there's joy in the room. There's life, there's purpose, there's redemption in the room. Everything that you need is in the room. Not from me, not from your pastor, Jesus. Because he's here and he brings all of who he is with him. All of who he is with him. And it, in, it again, just reinforces Jesus' words in Matthew 18 that where two or three are gathered, there I am. Well, there's quite a few of us in the room today. And I believe uh, as we're going to be transitioning here, there are a few things that I feel the Lord wanted me to remind you of this morning. First one is this. There might be a lot of people in the room, you watching online, you might not even feel like you're a part of it because you're not in the room. God is with you in your room, wherever you might be watching and tuning in. We're so happy to connect with you um, in the online space. Uh, we're just honored that you are joining us this morning. And I just believe that God would want to remind you that even though there's a lot of people here, that you are not just another son or daughter taking up space on the planet Earth. That he knows you. He sees you. He calls you by your name. That all over the world, there are people calling upon the name of Jesus, believing for him to intervene in their situation, in their lives, and yet he hears you in your own space of the world. You have never been lost to him. You've never been lost to him. Second thing I feel led to remind us of is there's something powerful about coming alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ. We've established that. And I believe that uh, we're going to go into some um, altar time here. And I think that the Lord um, would want you to be reminded that whatever, if you feel like you've been in a really challenging season and you feel like, spiritually speaking, you, you and the enemy, you've like been taking it to the mat in your faith. And discouragement, disappointment, disillusionment, whatever other dis has just sort of gotten on you. And I believe that the Lord wants to help you get your fight back this morning. The third thing is this. We've been given, third reminder, we've been given a powerful and effective weapon, and that is our worship. It shifts atmospheres. Not only here, it shifts atmospheres in your car. It shifts atmospheres in your home. Worship is so much more than a song, so much more than instruments. It's more than just a religious duty or something that we do on Sunday mornings. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. Man. Psalm 22, verse 3 tells us that God inhabits our praises. The author of this psalm and others is beloved David. We love David. He penned psalms that reflected his weariness in contending for the faith which then reinforces our point earlier that faith isn't denying reality. It just doesn't stay there. He acknowledged what he was feeling, but he didn't stay stuck there. But some of his psalms, we read things that he penned that sound like this. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Remember God. God, where are you? Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Remember God. 
What was he doing when he was penning those very honest and real verses? He was reminding his heart and his soul that he was created to worship God. And that our God, his God, my God, your God, inhabits the praises of his people. <laughs> Again, what it doesn't say, God doesn't inhabit our gossip, our negativity, murmuring and complaining. It says he inhabits as our praises. Fourth thing, I want to remind you of something that can be easily forgotten when we're fighting the good fight of faith, and that is this. You have the king of courage living on the inside of you. You have the king of courage living on the inside of you. The lion of the tribe of Judah is living on the inside of you. I mean, Selah, let's pause and think about that for the next 100 years. You have the Lord of Lords, the king of kings, creator, author of worship itself, living on the inside of you. Wow. Mark is going to lead us in a song uh, that's been on my heart for us uh, for this service. And I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. And as we sing this song, there's a, um, uh, there's a the chorus part is, um, oh, so don't you get quiet on me. You have a lion on the inside of you. And so for those of you, my heart is just so tender and sensitive to those that might be feeling just like weighed down by things. You feel weighed down by things. I want to encourage you today to prophesy and declare over yourself in the battle weariness that you will not grow silent, that you will lift your shout of praise, and that you will open up your voice and that you will worship, that you will sing into the disappointment, that you will sing into the discouragement, that you will sing into the hopelessness, that you will sing and worship into the challenges. Amen? Oh, my word.